So here we go with chapter three. Oh, unfortunately, we have a whole page of definitions in order to start discussing this. We have to talk about electromagnetic radiation. That is going to be any form of radiant energy in the electromagnetic spectrum. Well, thank you very much. That's just so illuminating. What's the electromagnetic spectrum then? A continuous range of radiant energy, including gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, visible infrared radio waves, everything. That's the thing. It's supposed to be the entire spectrum. Then we have Sir James Clerk Maxwell. Yep, there's a sir there because the queen knighted him for his work in science. The electric field and the magnetic field are perpendicular to one another in any light ray. Oh, oh okay, interesting. A definition of wavelength, the distance from one wave crest to another. All right, I'm gonna draw that because that needs drawing. If I have a wave then, and I'll draw this as a sine wave because that's kind of what it is. It's a sine wave. This is a wavelength, one wave crest to another. That's your wavelength. Then there's frequency. Frequency is the number of crests that pass a stationary point per second because this thing's moving. The wave itself is moving through space. So if you stay still and you let it go past you every time you see a peak, in the electric field, you would say, aha, there went one, there went another one, there went another one, and you would count how many came through in a second. And that would be your frequency. Because one of the important people who was working on this way back when was named Hertz, they've decided to give a frequency unit the name Hertz. It means per second. So if you see something and it says so many Hertz, it's just so many cycles per second, cycles, crests, however you want to say it. How many per second? Now, wavelength and frequency are inversely related. Well, why is that? If I have this right here as my wave, I could say this is a wavelength, okay? That's its wavelength. It's moving, well, it's light, right? So it's moving at the speed of light, which is a set number, which we call C. Oh, it's moving very quickly, okay? So many times you can just say 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So it's moving that quickly. What's moving that quickly? Well, any crest on it is moving that quickly. If I just freeze on this crest and ride it like I was surfing in, okay? That's how fast the crest would be moving and the crest following it and the crest following that. All of them are moving at that speed because these are not stretching out or getting crunched together. They are of a particular frequency and wavelength. So the wavelength is not going to change as it radiates through space. So if I have this one, it's moving at this speed. What if I have another one that's You'll have to pardon my drawing here. It's not gonna be fantastic. It's not gonna look very much like a sine wave because I'm trying to do it too quickly. You can see that this wavelength is quite a lot smaller, right? But the whole thing is moving just as quickly. So from here to here, this whole grouping moves at the same speed. For this one, you would see two in the amount of time that you saw one, two, three, four, five, six of these. And if you look, you see the wavelength here is one sixth of the wavelength there. Okay, so what can we do with that sort of information? We can start talking about the properties of light. Generally, we think of light and it acts like a wave. And we can see here that parenthetically, I said that this was proven by both Faraday and Maxwell in the 1850s. I mean, that's a while ago, right? Faraday worked on things first. Faraday was very focused on magnetics. Maxwell's the person who put together all the information from the different people who were working on both electricity and magnetism. So Faraday was one of the people that he visited and took into account all of his experiments when he put it all together. Both of them gave us new sets of equations that didn't have anything to do with the physics that Newton had put together earlier. So that was a very interesting development that was happening. So here's my example, essentially, 
repeated with better graphics. Here's a wavelength, and then here you can see the wavelength is much smaller, but you can see if the whole thing's moving past you, very few of these are going to move past you, while a lot of these will move past you in the same amount of time. More waves per second, but it's a short wave because of the wavelength being much smaller here. I apologize for the obliqueness and opacity of this particular table because it's a little bit much to take in. So let's just start by looking at just one column at a time. So this first column talks about the different types of radiation. These are all electromagnetic waves, all of them. So we have x-rays and gamma rays, ultraviolet, which you know full well, will give you a sunburn. Then under the category of visible light, see how there's a gap here? We have the different colors that people normally associate with visible light, starting at violet, which is closest to ultraviolet, running through to red, which is closest to infrared, and then past that you get microwaves and radio waves. So we commonly associate infrared with just heat microwaves well, if you put something in a microwave oven, it does end up heating up, right? On this end, we're talking about radiation that tends to heat things. Up here, we're talking about radiation that tends to ionize things. Oh, ionize. Well, we haven't really talked about that yet, but we, we do just naturally, at this point in our lives, know that ultraviolet light will give us a sunburn, and that's not good. An infrared lamp will not give us a sunburn, it'll just make us feel warm. In between, we have visible light that we can see with our eyes. Now, what are they doing here with the frequency? They aren't just telling you in hertz. Instead, every number that they put in here should be multiplied by 10 to the 14th hertz. Okay, that's nice. I'm not sure I'm really pleased by that number, but okay. Why'd they do it? So that all these numbers wouldn't say, you know, 8.6 times 10 to the 14th. They just decided everything's going to be in here 10 to the 14th. These middle ones, that's easy to make the substitution. The beginning one and the end one are very weird, though. So what's this greater than 10 to the 3rd? 10 to the 14th is already greater than 10 to the 3rd. What are they talking about? Well, you'd take the 10 to the 3rd and multiply it by the 10 to the 14th. X-rays and gamma rays would have frequencies that are more than 10 to the 17th hertz. And down here, it's less than, right? This is 10 to the negative third. Okay, we'll multiply that by 10 to the 14th, then we'll get 10 to the 11th. So waves that are less than 10 to the 11th hertz. All right, so that helps unpack how weirdly they wrote this. Frequency and wavelength. We already had discussed by drawing a picture how if you made the wavelength smaller, you were going to increase the frequency because they're all traveling at the same speed, the speed of light. We have a formula for that, lambda, which stands for the wavelength times frequency, nu. This is the Greek letter nu. It doesn't look much like an n to me, which nu reminds me of n, but okay, there it is. So lambda nu equals c. If you multiply these together, you're going to get the speed of light. I'd like to think about that a little more. So I'm going to write it down for a minute. Yeah. Lambda and then nu. It looks like a v, but it's got a little serif on it. Equals c. This is a constant, like I said. We can often say it's just 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So what's this? Well, a wavelength? Well, that should be a length, meters. And a frequency? Well, we said hertz, but we said hertz really meant per second. So there's per second. Oh, well, that's meters over seconds. So good. If we look at the dimensional analysis, it makes sense. When we see that formula, it means that since this is a constant, the speed of light is a constant, that these guys are inversely related. If one of them goes up, the other one has to go down. That's what we see here. As these go up, these are going down. Let's take a closer look in here at the table then. Here's a number that's 8.6. If I go down here, I can find a number that is half of that, 4.3. This is 350. The number on the same line is double. So when one was halved, the other was doubled. Okay, that makes sense. 
if you multiply them together, you're going to get a constant, the speed of light. These wavelengths are listed in nanometers. Nano, we have to remember that. You know, that was in a previous chapter, but nano meant 10 to the minus 9. So this would be 350 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. That's how we would deal with this. And the last column we'll talk about more on another slide. Here's a wave. They've sort of looked at it as it's going away from us like this. It's just heading off obliquely, not straight away from us. So we can see that the waves are up and down and the wavelength is between peaks and the amplitude is from the zero line to the peak. So that's a different thing that we hadn't put on our graph over here. We have a nice wave like this. We will say, okay, let's just put a thing down the middle. That's an amplitude. This could also be the amplitude, but it'd be in the negative direction. So we would have to put, you know, absolute value on it. But that's your amplitude. Peak from the center.